couple of announcements as we get going this week. It is somehow the start of a new month. I did not give permission for the calendar to tick over, and yet it did it anyway. Um, so coming up, prayer group is not meeting this week. The 12th is deacons and prayer group. The 17th, uh, Benjamin and Tricia are going to lead worship for us. We'll have communion and Right now, we've got scheduled to have fellowship at the Sea Locks following worship on that date. Things may get pushed depending on COVID levels there. Um, then the 18th is health ministry and cancer support group, plan deadline on the 19th, and prayer group. And then session is actually going to meet on the 20th this month. Um, what do we have in the way of other announcements this morning? All right, it is a holiday weekend, apparently. Let's worship God. Let's join together in our call to worship. Let us acknowledge the company in which we meet. The church, the church on, on earth, earth and, and in, in heaven. heaven. The faithful who worshiped here before us. The hundreds, the hundreds of thousands of, of every place and language who on, on the Lord's day, day set, set, set their, their lives within, within the atmosphere, atmosphere of, of renewing grace. As we think of them, let, let us take, take deliberate, deliberate encouragement, encouragement from our, our unity, unity with, with them, them all. all. Amen. Amen. Let's join together in the hymn of praise, number 625, How Great Thou Art.
are a people born of water and the spirit. We have made promises to be Christ's faithful disciples and to show his love to our life's end. Although we fail to fulfill those baptismal vows, God's faithful love endures forever. Confident of God's grace, let us confess our sin and the sin of this world. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future which we can be changed and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Hear the good news. As people born of water and the spirit, we have died to the old life. A new life has begun. God's grace is poured out upon us day by day. Be thankful and live as one who has been raised to new life. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to have just a very, very brief minute for mission. Uh, the City Council of the City of Marion responded favorably to our grant request at their meeting last week. We have been awarded $20,000 to expand our mission and ministry in the area. We are still waiting on the official paperwork because it can't come without paperwork, right? And so um, part of what session we'll be doing this month is prioritizing figuring out exactly what things will cost because nothing costs what it cost a week ago. And uh, coming back to talk with you throughout the next month and into August about what those plans are and, and how they will impact our ministry and enable our ministry in new ways. So good news that that grant has come through. And now we actually have the work of living into that grant and uh, making sure it's things we can hold up our end of the bargain on. So those things are for that. And that brings us to our first lesson. So we have, uh, this is our third week of looking at characters who appear three times in John's gospel. And this week is Thomas. And I found as preparing for this, that uh, Thomas is actually in a lot of big scenes. We just forget that he's there. So this is the first one. Then after this, Jesus said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and you are going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep but I am going to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Now, I invite you all to pay attention very closely to the anthem because it is in the hymnal. We're going to sing it again at the begin at the benediction. And if any of you all want to join in with us at the benediction, you are more than welcome to do so. So if you want to look at number 705 in the hymnal and track along, that's what we'll be singing right now. There will be a test later. You are holy. You are holy. You are mighty. You are mighty. You are worthy. You are worthy. Worthy of praise. Worthy of praise. And I will follow. And I will live my life for you. You are holy. You are holy. You are mighty. You are mighty. You are worthy. You are worthy. Worthy of praise. Worthy of praise. I will follow. I will follow. I will listen. And I will live my life for you. We pick up in the 13th chapter of John, which we did not actually read this past year as we read through John. Um, and some of the pieces that we sort of know of the story are, are trapped in this part of things. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified. And God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And as I said to the Jews, now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth 
and a life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, our next hymn is number 306, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. You may be seated. We now return to the passage that most of us know Thomas from, from the 20th chapter of John's gospel. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the 12 was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails in my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We know Thomas mainly from that last passage. Uh, In the Protestant church, that is where Thomas lives. And he lives there in our language, in our idiom, even in cartoons. There's a cartoon that floats around right at Easter every year because typically we read that story on the second Sunday of Easter, you know, the Sunday after the big Easter Sunday. And this cartoon has Thomas and Peter talking, saying, how come I'm still doubting Thomas and you're not denying Peter? And so here we are with one slice of Thomas, but we get three actual appearances of Thomas in John's gospel. 
And when we do our church history, we find out a little bit more about Thomas. The front cover of your bulletin has Thomas, St. Thomas, on a stamp in India. Now, why would he be on a stamp in India? Well, that's where legend has it he went to do evangelism in the days after the crucifixion and the resurrection to the extent that there is a whole branch of the church known as St. Thomas Christians. And some of them are Catholic and some of them are Orthodox and some of them are Protestant and some of them are Anglican. But together there are 6 million St. Thomas Christians. And the cross on the front of your bulletin is a St. Thomas cross. Legend has Thomas also making it to other places like Indonesia and close by Paraguay. Yes, you heard me right. Legend among the Guarani tribes in Paraguay has Thomas coming and preaching to them in the first century AD. And this is documented as far back as 1600. More than just doubting Thomas, right? So we start off with this introduction, and this is right before the resurrection of Lazarus. So Jesus has been told that Lazarus is ill. Jesus has decided to wait two days before going back to Bethany. And now he's telling the disciples, let's go, on, let's go back to Bethany. And the disciples are like, you remember what happened the last time we were in Bethany, right? We were not well received, and we were kind of run out of town on a rail. And as a matter of fact, the last time we were there, they tried to kill you. Are you sure you want to do this? And Jesus basically says, yes, it's time to do this. The sun is out. It's time to go do things that the world can see. And Thomas kind of seems almost like he's stealing Simon Peter's line. Well, then we'll go with you even if we die. I'm not sure it's that quite that gung-ho but there is a statement here and this is the first and to the best of my knowledge the only time a disciple says this in the gospel that we the disciples will go and die with christ now that happens to be the experience of almost every disciple very few of them live to a comfortable old age and die in their sleep We saw last week or two weeks ago, Andrew comes to a very painful end and Thomas does and Peter does and Paul does and you can go through the list. But Thomas at that point is willing to say, willing to speak up. And I kind of wonder, I really wish somebody had recorded these, these encounters on video. Oh, well. I really wonder what the kind of groups of disciples are in the sidebar conversations they're having. How many of them are saying, nothing, mm -mm, not going, can't make me do it, don't want to go to Bethany, didn't work last time, not going to work this time. And then how many of them are kind of with Thomas that like, well, if Jesus says it's okay, let's go. Thomas ends up being the one who speaks here, which is really surprising to me because this is, well, as I said, one of three times when he makes an appearance in the gospel. The next encounter with Thomas, really, we lose behind all of the quotable language in it. It starts off at the beginning of the passage we read, which is the end of chapter 13, with, I give you a new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Well, I mean, how many sermons have we preached on that? We move from there to, in my father's house, there are many mansions. Well, that one's been preached on a ton too. Sticks in the memory. And from there, we move on and actually we skip Thomas's question 90% of the time to get to Jesus's answer, which is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the father but through me. But we, we skip this whole little conversation in between. So, Peter... As a question, of course he does. When Jesus says, I'm going away, you can't follow me now. Peter says, well, how come I can't? 
Notice that he says, how come I can't? I would lay down my life for you. That sounds like Thomas a chapter or two ago. And yet Jesus responds to that question. Why can't I follow you now by saying, oh, really? You'd lay down your life for me. I tell you before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. And then we get stuck on that. Peter, we spent a lot of time with Peter. Jesus goes on to say that he is going and they know where he is going. They do not know where he's going, but they know the way. And Thomas, Thomas, I kind of imagine like he's sitting there in class and the teacher has said, okay, everybody's got this, right? And everybody is waiting for somebody else to say, I don't understand what's happening here. Thomas, in my head, raises his hand and says, okay, Jesus. If we don't know where you're going, how do we know how to get there? I mean, it seems like a fairly logical, simple question to me. If I don't know where you're going, how, am I, how do I know how to get there? And Jesus then answers that Jesus is the way. Jesus is the path. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. And we've used that passage in a lot of ways over the years and almost always forgotten that it comes out of a very specific question asked by a person of faith. We often address that passage at people we think are not of the faith to tell them that they got to get some Jesus. There is one way, and it is Christ, and that is it. It's often how the passage is used. That's not accurate to the context. The context is a person of faith, a disciple of Christ, asking, how do we do this thing that you're asking us to do? How do we do this thing that you are telling us we should be doing? Thomas doesn't ask any questions about well, Jesus, you say you're coming back. When is that going to be? We have also gotten incredibly preoccupied on that question. Instead, he just wants to know how it's supposed to happen. How does this work, Jesus, that you're going to go away and there's a place prepared for me, and yet I don't know how to... Okay, Jesus, you just got to explain this to me. And Jesus does in a much more straightforward way than he responds to Peter. Jesus says, I'm it, follow me, follow me. And that brings us to the 20th chapter of John where we are on the first Sunday of Easter. And the start of this passage, if we read it all the way through as we normally do on the second Sunday of Easter would say that they were gathered in the upper room for fear of the Jews, except Thomas who apparently is not that afraid because he's not there. And Jesus somehow manifests in the room, says hi, shows them his hands and his side. They rejoice. Jesus breathes on them, gives them the Holy Spirit, and then Jesus vanishes. And then Thomas comes back in. We don't know if he's out for pizza, tacos, Starbucks. We don't know what he went to get. He's just not in the room. And the disciples do exactly what the disciples should do. They tell Thomas they have seen the risen Christ. That is exactly what they're supposed to do. And then Thomas says, well, I'm not going to believe it until I can put my fingers in the hands, my hand in the side. Now, let's stop there for a moment. You know the various Easter stories, right? We've heard them a lot over the years. I think each gospel tells it slightly differently. In how many gospels do the disciples believe the first time somebody tells them that Jesus is risen? It is a grand total of zero. In John's gospel, Mary comes back and tells the disciples that she has seen the Lord, and they don't believe her. So Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved race to the tomb to see. 
They need to see for themselves this thing that is being told to them that is beyond their ability to comprehend. That's exactly what happens in the synoptics as well. The women go to the men, and the men go, no, uh And the men have to go see for themselves. Thomas is being exactly as boneheaded as the rest of the disciples are about Easter. Nuh-uh, not until I see it myself. But we tend to then make that a big deal, mainly because of Jesus' closing line here, do not doubt but believe. And we forget that Thomas then makes a proclamation that none of the other disciples have made, my Lord and my God. He makes a big statement about who Jesus is. And part of what I want to get at today is that I think we've, we've given Thomas short shrift and the short end of the stick historically. What I hear Thomas doing is really, really, really wanting to believe. But his brain or his heart is having a hard time with it. And so he is saying, this is what I need. This is what I need. This is what would enable me to believe with no holdbacks, no reservation, no hesitation. He starts off being willing to die with Jesus. Then he is willing to ask a hard question in the middle of all of this not straightforward Jesus talk, which we get a lot of. He's willing to say, I don't get it. How is this supposed to work? How am I supposed to follow you when I don't know where you're going? If you've ever tried to drive somewhere and have somebody follow you in the car, you know what a problem that can be. And then Thomas doesn't manage to get caught up in what so easily could become divine peer pressure of the disciples. Oh, sure, I believe. You guys told me that's good enough. All of you, you believe it. It must be right. Sure. Right? I mean, how many times have we gone along with the crowd because the crowd was loud and vocal and they seemed to be very convinced at what they were saying? Thomas is willing to say, nope, nope, I got to see it for myself. I have to see it for myself. You guys got to see the hands and the side, and I want to see the hands and the side. It is interesting to me that when Jesus shows up the second time a week later, the way John reports it, he stands there and basically says, hey, Thomas, here it is. This is what you need. This is what I'm giving you. My hands and my side. Thomas knows what his limits are. He knows painfully well what his stumbling blocks to belief are. And he is courageous enough to ask for those to be addressed. I mean, let's be honest, telling God what you need is something a lot of us do an awful lot silently in prayer and what few of us would be gutsy enough to do to God's face. I think we've done Thomas a bit of a disservice by limiting him to just this one Easter encounter and this one phrase, do not doubt, but believe. I can tell you, I would prefer not to have people remember me for the next 2,000 years based on one thing I did, one day I had. And yet we've been willing to do that with Thomas. Thomas is going to go out from here. And if the history of the church is to be believed, he's going to head further east 
He's going to head to where there was a small community of Jews in India in the first century. And he is going to preach and proclaim the gospel to the extent that Jerome and Eusebius record in the second and third and fourth centuries that there is a group of Christians in India in the second century AD reading the gospel of Thomas in Hebrew. Thomas is one of the most popular names in Christianity in India. And there's no doubting about it. Even in the Western church, one of the greatest theologians of the Middle Ages is St. Thomas Aquinas. Sir Thomas More. We have three Toms in our congregation all the time, and we don't attach doubting to any of the three of them. That could have something to do with the personalities of the three of them. I'd like us to imagine, to imagine what it could be like if we had the courage of Thomas to say to the world, to say to God, I'm struggling with this and I want to believe desperately this is what I need and to see God provide it. I hope that perhaps when we start to be in those rooms and people start asking questions about faith, that we can hear not doubt as much as we can hear sincerity wanting to believe deeply. Questions not coming from a point of challenge to faith, but from a point of desire for faith. And give our neighbors the benefit of the doubt as to why they're asking the question they're asking. Thomas only has three appearances on stage. They are all eclipsed by what is happening around them. I mean, Easter, come on. Who is going to get any attention on Easter? I am the way, the truth, and the life. In my Father's house are many mansions. I give you a new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Yeah. I don't really need any other texts. We can preach on those for decades. Let's go raise a man from the dead. Thomas is involved in all three of those. And we know that because John thought it was important enough to remind us that Thomas was there. So this next week, I invite you to go out and think about what it is your faith needs now. What it is your faith has needed in the past. And who it is that you know who in the life of faith is unafraid to speak up like Thomas. To God alone be the glory to stay and forevermore. Amen. Friends, our affirmation of faith is the first and second questions from the study catechism. Yours is the bold type. What is God's purpose for your life? God wills that I should live by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ for the love of God and in the communion of the Holy Spirit. How do you live by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ? I am not my own. I have been bought with a price. The Lord Jesus Christ loved me and gave himself for me. I entrust myself completely to his care, giving thanks each day for his wonderful goodness. Friends, let us respond to the good news by giving of our tithes and talents and preparing our prayers for God. Let us give and receive our morning offering.
You may be seated. Friends, we bring not just the work of our hands, the produce of our lives before God, we bring our hopes, our fears, our dreams, our wonder, and our awe before God. Will you pray with me? God, we come to you this day as we come to you so many days with much on our hearts and much on our minds about the state of our world, about our neighbors, about our communities, about ourselves. We come to you this day, both with a list of things that we would love to see happen and a list of things that we give you thanks for. We give you thanks for safe travel on getting folks around. And we pray for more safe travel for all the people traveling this weekend. We pray for those who grieve and mourn, even as they celebrate the life and resurrection of loved ones. We ask you to be with those who are ill and struggling with their health and with those who love them and who cannot be at their bedsides and be with them. We ask you to be with all the caregivers. God, we give you thanks for all the ways in which our prayers have been answered medically. We come before you this day looking out into a world where often we are known by the last thing we did or that bad thing we did once. And we ask you to give us confidence that we are more than that and that you see the whole of our lives. We come before you this day as disciples on the way who pray as you taught us, our Father, who hallowed him, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our hymn of sending today is number 817. We walk by faith and not by sight.
Friends, as we go out this week, we have spent three weeks looking at folks we often overlook in Scripture, Andrew, Nicodemus, and Thomas. And we have seen a fullness in their faith stories that we don't always get. This week, I encourage you to go out into the fullness of your faith story and the faith story of your neighbors. Tell more than the highs, tell more than the lows, and watch for the untold stories of faith all around us. Friends, go and may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us and abide with us this day and forevermore. Amen. You are holy. You are holy. You are mighty. You are mighty. You are worthy. You are worthy. Worthy of praise. Worthy of praise. And I will follow. I will follow. I will listen. I will listen. All of my days, all of my days, and I you will are Lord of Lords, you are King of Kings, you are mighty God, Lord of everything, and you are Emmanuel, you are the great I am, you are the Prince of Peace, who is the Lamb, and you are the living God, you are my saving grace, you will reign forever, you are ancient of days. You are Alpha, Omega, beginning and end. You're my Savior, Messiah, Redeemer, and Friend. You're my Prince of Peace, and I will live my life for you. You are holy. You are holy. You are mighty. You are mighty. You are worthy. You are worthy. And I will live my life for you.